Okay, with this data, we've got information about ewes. Sometimes they don't have a lamb, sometimes they do have a lamb. And we want to see if there is evidence here that they spend a different amount of time grazing um, when they don't have a lamb as when they do have a lamb. Okay, and the thing we need to pick up from this is this is a matched pairs design. I've got 16 columns in my data and there are just 16 U's. So these are the same 16 U's and each column refers to two measurements for one U. Once when it did have a lamb and once at the same time of year, autumn, when it didn't have a lamb. And this is the best design to use if you can manage it or a good design because um, the variations between different U's shouldn't matter. I'm comparing each U with themselves. So U's that seem to spend a lot of time grazing, this one here, the both numbers seem to be quite high. I'm comparing that U with herself. So um, the variation between different U's is going to be taken into account, as I say. So first thing we have to do, uh, we're going to do the hypothesis test later, we're going to have to talk about an assumption, but there's just a bit of number crunching. Because I've got two measurements for each U, I have to work out whether the time spent grazing uh, with the lamb was more or less. So I subtract these numbers. Now I could subtract them either way around. Okay, and it doesn't really matter which way around I did the subtraction. Sometimes when we're thinking about a value changing, I could be thinking, well, this is getting um, smaller, so I'll have a negative difference. And I'm going to do it that way, but I could just as well subtract them the other way around. So I'm going to do 55.5 minus 72.0, and my calculator is giving me a negative answer of minus 16.5, so that's great, minus 16.5. But now I've got to be consistent, so I've got to do all the subtractions with the second value minus the first one. Okay, so I'm going to get a negative answer here, but I'm going to get a positive answer here, because I'm going to be doing the bigger value minus the smaller one. So now we've got that agreed, We just I'm just going to work out those differences. Okay, so that was a bit of easy number crunching. Now uh, for the second one, we've got to say what assumption is necessary for a matched pairs t-test. Well, it is matched pairs. But uh, why is it a t-test? Well, I use a t-test um, when it's a small sample, less than 30, and we're going to be having to estimate uh, a standard deviation from the data, which we are going to have to. Those aren't assumptions, those are just facts of the case. Um, but I can only use a t-test if the data comes from normal distributions. So I have to assume something's normal, and specifically, the numbers I'm going to be working with are actually these differences. Okay, now it's most likely the differences will be normal if the populations were normal, but the assumption I need is that the differences follow a normal distribution. So that's my assumption, the differences are normally distributed. Okay, so now I've got to go on and conduct the test. I've got to do all five stages. So first step is the hypothesis. So what are my hypotheses going to be? I need an H0 and an H1. Well, for all of these comparison of means questions, the null hypothesis is going to be the two means are the same. So H0 is easy, it always looks like this. Now for the alternate hypothesis, that depends on what I'm investigating. Am I interested in any old difference between the two means, or am I interested in one being larger than the other? So we have to look at the wording, and the investigation is to find out whether the time they spend grazing is the same. Okay, so I've got that already as H0, so the, uh, but it's not mentioning that the alternative to that has to be one direction or the other. So therefore my alternate hypothesis is simply that the means are different. So I've done step one, I've got my hypotheses. The next um, uh, step is the test statistic. So I have to work out a value of my test statistic. It's a t-test, so I'm going to be calling it t. But to find out how to do that working out, I have to navigate to the correct place. So we've got various notes in the um, formula book that you've got for the different tests you can do. So here's one of those pages. Okay, This is page four. No, it's not. It's page five. And, oh, look, it's talking about paired samples. OK, so on page four, the other one, you had some information relating to what you would do if you had um, two completely independent samples. So here's the page four, in fact. Yeah. So these ones here, independent samples. I haven't got that. These are not some U's and then a completely different set of other U's. These are the same U's twice in matched pairs. So it's definitely this that I need. And I know it's going to be a t-test, okay? It's not going to be a normal test because these are small samples and I am going to have to use an estimated um, standard deviation. So it's definitely a t-test. And my formula for t is 
it says d bar minus mu, okay, um, over a standard deviation of the differences, okay, so d bar means the mean of the differences, okay, and I need an n for the sample size, that's going to be easy. So I'm going to need an estimated sample, uh, a standard deviation. And then this mu here, what does that mean? That means the population mean of the differences according to my null hypothesis. Well, my null hypothesis is that the two mean times spent grazing are the same. So that uh, mean difference, that mu in the formula, is always going to be zero for every test we do. Okay, so um, we're going to have our mu is zero because there is no difference in the, the times, uh, the mean times under the null hypothesis. Uh, my d bar, I'm going to need a value for that. I haven't got that yet. And I'm going to need a sigma d, an estimated standard deviation for the, um, for the differences. And I'm going to need an n value. Okay. Well, uh, d bar is going to be straightforward. I can just enter this data onto my calculator and get a mean. Okay. Um, and I'm also going to be using my calculator data to get this um, estimated standard deviation. And I can fill in straight away. Um, I've got 16 in use. I've got two measurements from each, but I've got 16 differences. So n is going to be 16. So I can fill that in. Right. So my next step is to go into my statistics mode. So that's uh, mode. Uh, statistics is mode 2. Now this is one variable data. I'm not doing regression or correlation. I'm just doing a, one bunch of numbers. They're all going to be differences. So I need to go into one var mode. Okay, I've got an x column. Okay, I haven't got a frequency column. Actually, I don't need it. So I'm just, just going to put my numbers in, uh, starting with my first difference, which we can see here is minus 16.5. Um, I'm going to enter those on my calculator. So that's done. I've gone all the way to 21.3. So I, having entered the data, press AC and go into my stats mode. So that's shift and then one. And I want to work out things like uh, means and variances. So I want four. And OK, N should be 16. I already know that. Uh, X bar, that's my D bar. So my mean is two. So the mean of these differences turns out to be 6.86. Two five. Probably don't need all of those decimal places, but they won't do me any harm. Okay. Now I need an estimated sigma. Okay. Now there are two ways you can do this. All right. Um, here, this kindly tells us that my estimate of sigma should be the square root of n times the sample uh, standard deviation squared. Okay. Over n minus one. Now remember. The Casio calculator is different in the way it uh, works out, the notation it uses. It uses sigma x, okay? So going back to that previous menu, going back to menu stats var, okay? This sigma x is the sample standard deviation, and this is the unbiased uh, estimator of the population standard deviation. Now, probably to be risk-free for, for semester two work, will be be just sticking all the time to the small one, the sta sample standard deviation three. So I'm going to do that. So the sample standard deviation is, okay, um, 11.925, uh, okay? But it's not this um, uh, estimated sigma for the population that's that. Um, it, this is SD, okay, which is 11.925. To um, five, okay. But to get my estimated um, sigma for the population, I need to do n times that squared over n minus one and square root it. So my uh, estimated uh, standard deviation is going to be the square root of n times this number squared, okay, which is going to be sixteen times the eleven point nine two five squared divided by n minus 1. Check on the formula. Yes, divide by n minus 1. And that's going to be a value. So if I do that, if I do um, the square root of uh, 16, I'll have to do, use some brackets here, 16 times that answer squared divided by 15, close brackets, 
equals, and that will give me the correct estimate for sigma hat d equals this number 12.315, so that's 12.32, okay? And that's the safe way of doing it using all of the information that we've got here on the formula sheet and remembering this is the sample standard deviation, okay? However, I feel duty bound to show you that on your calculator, if you simply go into the VAR menu and you do the other one, the SX one, which doesn't correspond to the SX mentioned in this formula, okay, because this is the population estimate, if we do this for um, SX, we get exactly that same number. The calculator builds in this calculation, all right? So, um, I leave that for you. I'm going to stick, um, the official party line is that we're always going to use these formulas and we're going to remember that the S in these formulas is the sample standard deviation, which the calculator unfortunately calls sigma and not S. Right, <sighs> that's the hard bit over with. Now we're just going ready to go on and work out the test statistic. So I've got the things in that formula. Let's remind ourselves what the formula was. We're going to be doing T. It's going to be the mean of the differences min minus what the null hypothesis tells us um, the difference of the, the means should be, which is going to be zero. So this thing is always going to be naught. Okay, so I could just miss it out. So it's going to be D bar minus naught divided by, okay, um, the uh, estimated standard deviation divided by root n. So here's that formula. So here it is, d bar, that's my 6.8625, minus mu, which we've said several times now is naught, so you can forget this part of the formula, divided by, the fraction is, um, the estimated sigma, which is 12.32, okay, divided by root n. So that's the square root of... Uh, 16. Okay, and I can enter that on my calculator. Now, um, when I was in stats mode, the calculator didn't actually type in my calculations in a very nice form. But if I go back into mode 1, then I can actually use my fraction button, which I like using. So let's do that. So let's have 6.8625 uh, on the top, 6.8625 on the top, and then we'll put another fraction in on the bottom. So I can enter the formula on my calculator exactly as I've written it down, press equals, and I get my test statistic, which it gives us this fraction, but the actual value of my test, test statistic is plus 2.23. So my T value is 2.23. So I now have a test statistic, and it's going to be downhill from now. I just need a critical value, and then I can do my comparison and my conclusion. Okay, so it's critical value time. Now, what I need for this are the things I normally need. I need to know my significance level, and my significance level from the question is 1%, so significance level is 1%. I definitely need to know whether it's one-tailed or two-tailed. And I didn't write this down when I did my hypotheses, but the alternative hypothesis was just that there was a difference in the mean, not one was uh, specifically one was greater than the other. So this is a two-tailed test. Okay, so my picture is going to be um, a distribution with two tails with the uh, 0.01 shared across the two tails. So this is going to be 0.005, and this is going to be 0.005. Okay, so I'm going to need to use tables as we did with z-tests. However, this is a t-test, so I need another thing. I need the degrees of freedom. Okay. But the degrees of freedom is simple to work out, and the formula for it, if you've forgotten, is here. Very simple formula. Degrees of freedom for a t-test is simply n minus 1. So uh, degrees of freedom is going to be 16 minus 1, which is 15. Okay? So I, I'm now ready to go to my table, but I need a probability to look up. Okay? Just as with the um, z tables, our t-table is organized only to talk about positive values for t, and it always wants to work with a large probability. Okay, so therefore, on my two-tailed diagram, okay, the tail, the pos positive t value, which the, ta the table will tell me about, is this one. Now, I've got 0 0.005 in this tail, so therefore, the, 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 the probability I need to look up of everything except that tail is 0.005. 
995. It's everything except this 0 0.005. So my table, I need to look up the critical value for 0 0.995 as my probability, and I need to use 15 degrees of freedom. So here's my table. So the column I need, need to be in is the 0 0.995 column. Okay, and the line I need to be on is this 15 degrees of freedom line. So the, the number I actually need is this one here, the 2.94, so 2.947. Now that's my positive critical value, 2.947, but it's a two-tailed test, so minus 2.947 is also a critical value. So I need to say my critical values are plus or minus 2.947. So I've done my third step. Next step, fourth step, is my comparison. So for my comparison, I need to take my test statistic, 2.23. Okay, so 2.23, I need to think where it is. Remember the big region, the unshaded region, uh, in this case in the middle, is where it is not significant. Okay, and then if it's in either of the tails, it is significant. So my value here of 2.23 is actually uh, a bit less than the 2.947. So I can see it's going to be in the not significant part. But I need to state a clear comparison. So I definitely need to say that my 2.23, okay, is less than this 2.947. Okay, but I also need to state what's really quite obvious, which is it doesn't get into this tail either, because it's actually the minus 2.947 is less than that. So when you've got a non-significant result on a two-tailed test, then really you should show that it's between the critical values in this area in the middle that is not significant. So this is what I write down for the comparison. And then, of course, we say, we've just said, not significant at the 1% level. OK, and because it's not significant, we therefore will be accepting H0. And because we're accepting H0, because it is not significant, we're wording our conclusion to say there is no evidence. So straight on to the last step, which is the conclusion. The conclusion is there is no evidence at the 1% 1 level. 1% 1 level. Okay, that, okay, so um, we're accepting H0 because we're not actually, we haven't got evidence for H1, and H1 was that the means are different, but I need to put that in context, I need to say which means are different, so therefore I need to say there is no evidence at the 1% level that the mean time spent, the mean percentage time spent grazing with a lamb is different from the mean time without a lamb. So there's my conclusion. There is no evidence at the 1% level that the mean percentage time spent grazing is different when the ewe has a lamb than when it does not. So I've, con I've interpreted in context, I've talked about means, I've talked about ewes, I've talked about grazing times, so that is fully in context. And so I'm done with this hypothesis test.